Hello and welcome back to Breakfast Daily on City TV. It's now time for our personality interview for today. And I have with me here Professor Goski Alabi. Now, when you mention uh, the name Alabi, um, there are a lot of Alabis, but one particular name rings, and that is Professor Joshua Alabi. So um, I'm sure you've made a connection there. <laughs> Good morning and welcome. Thank Prof. you very much. How are Good you morning. doing? I'm well by grace. Great. So um, you've been in the news for the past about two or three days um, following your article on um, sex for grades. And you have actually said we shouldn't look at one side of the coin. There's another side to it. Um, so I don't know if you want to speak to this issue before we actually delve into um, talking about you, family, and all that. So um, what your take was that ladies also intentionally seduce these lecturers. So from a point of view as a, um, a professor, someone who has worked in academia for a long time, what will you say the real challenges are when it comes to academia and the sex for grades? Well, thank you very much. Um, I think that, first of all, um, sexual misconduct in the higher education environment it's not limited to West Africa. Mm. It is almost a global phenomenon. And it is something that is eating the integrity of the academic institutions up. Mm. We would only pretend that it is a linear problem. problem. It is one-sided, you know, that it is not complex. It is very complex. First of all, Indeed, there is harassment where you have people of the opposite sex, particularly men, believed to go after younger ladies, to have some kind of relationship with them in order to favor them in a way. The other side of the coin is that there are young ladies or females who intentionally seduce the men. In fact, sometimes the men do not on their own go in for this young ladies or these females. But the ultimate decision lies with the men. The ultimate decision lies with the men just as the ultimate decision lies with us, the women. You see, I am a woman too, and I believe that for a very long time, we have been using the feministic lens in discussing this issue. But I believe we need to move away from the feministic lens to a gender perspective where we're looking not only at the female sensitivities, but also the male sensitivities. If we really want to mitigate the problem, then we need to be very honest about it. Mm -hmm. We don't just need to be moved by emotions and some kind of ideologies about feminism to say, oh yes, so and so, it doesn't matter how I dress or it, you have to take very good care of yourself and control yourself. Why don't we, as females, also, you know, control ourselves? Mm. If a lecturer invites you to his home and you're not interested and you know the intention, why do you go? But we also have the situation where we have females who send text messages and say, Oh, I learned um, you're not married or your wife is not in this week. Can I come in and cook for you? Who asked you to go cook for that lecturer? And why are you offering that free service? Is there really any free lunch? Mm. So indeed, I'm not looking at whether people ought to control themselves and the males are not able to control themselves. I'm looking at the intentionality of attempting to seduce them and they also harassing the females. This is what I'm saying we should look at. And it is honest. It mm -hmm. is the truth. Mm -hmm. You know. So 
we as females have a role to play in protecting our own selves just as the males need to know you know it's very funny when they do they laugh at the men i have had you know um young um students male students come to me and say prof you see they actually kept the lecturer on speaker and said oh this guy he comes to the class and does as if we floored him. Then they will laugh. Mm -hmm. And then on knowing to this male lecturers who think they have gotten something, the young ladies will put them on speaker. Mm -hmm. Then as they speak, their colleagues will be laughing at them. Or sometimes they show the text messages to their colleagues. You see, so for... For, to protect their own careers, to protect themselves, the males need to understand that there is no free lunch, just as the females need to understand the same, unless we ourselves begin to realize that. Sometimes it is very unsolicited. Mm. The people want the grace because they don't want to learn. The people also want money. There was a, a text message that one young lady came to show to me. And she said, the text message read, Oh, get, get away. What do you think? Look, then she was flipping some notes. I have your school fees. Your father has given me your school fees. Are you getting yeah. that? Young ladies want to use iPhone 11 Plus. <laughs> Pro Plus. <laughs> In fact, they want to have it the very day it dropped. <laughs> and this is a fact. And they're not working. They're in school. So when do we expect them to get the money to buy iPhone mm. Pro Plus mm. 11, <laughs> whatever it's called, <laughs> you know? And so these are the realities. Mm. I mean, you sit in your office and young ladies come and say they need school fees. Mm. And the next thing is that they have to do anything possible to get a school fees. Okay, so for you as um, um, a lecturer, um, you actually introduced um, a dress code. Yes. Yes, and how has it impacted in UPSA, I mean the, the entire campus? I do not believe that we have a 100% solution. But I believe that we can have certain things in place that would proactively seek to protect the young ladies just as it will protect the lecturers as well. I mean, we shouldn't say that in a society, everybody can control his or himself. When I have seen young ladies who would dress in a way that is not only suggestive but it is actually misleading and as I wrote in my piece mm -hmm. they actually will put the shine and glitz where it has to be and will position themselves in such a way that you would actually see what they want to communicate and you would get the communication but if you are appropriately dressed at least that part of the problem where someone can be misled or someone can lose God may be taken away. Mm. So I think that to a very large extent, it helps in solving the problem. Mm. I mean, it is for our own benefit that we dress well, mm. that we appear well, okay. particularly in UPSA, because of the professional brand attached to it. Mm. We need to know and understand what professional dress standards are and comply with them. We need okay. to understand professional grooming and appear professional. Okay. All right, Prof. So you are an accomplished academic. Now, what made you actually go into academia when you actually um, had bad grades um, during your A-level? Well, having bad grades, it's not a failure. Mm. 
but it actually puts a lot of people off because you get discouraged. But um, I'm really wondering what actually pushed you to still uh, get so accomplished. You see, I believe that as society, we make very, very big mistake. We equate what somebody knows or what somebody has learned to grades. And I'm very confident to say that I wasn't a bad student. It was the educational system that failed me at that time because I studied very hard. Being in school meant that I knew that on my own, I couldn't have passed. So my parents took me to school so that the school would train me, transform me, and prepare me to pass. It was the responsibility of the school to ensure that I pass. But the school didn't fail me. It was the examination system that got it wrong. Mm. Because if the examination system got it right, right, without rewriting, I went into the university and I didn't even get one referral throughout my university education, not one referral. So I want to say to young people that, see, grades should not define you. What you know and what you have learned and what you can do with what you know is what is important. I believe that in, in the next few decades, we're going to have a society that is not over-reliant on grades. And it's coming. Mm. In fact, when you go to some of the developed countries, the very serious organizations are no longer asking for grades and certificates. They are asking, what do you have to offer? What can you do? That is the big deal. Okay. So um, can you tell us um, what being Little Gosky looked like? <laughs> Where did you grow up? Which schools did you attend from your kindergarten through to university? Okay. So it was very interesting because what I remember was that I lived with my grandparents when I was growing up. So I had, I had a kind of checkered life. My father was a university graduate. He was a civil engineer. Mm -hmm. And I recall that when I was very little in class one or something like that. Which school? Okay, so I'll tell you about the school. Okay. When I was that age, my father, mother, and siblings lived in, you know, a Bangalore story building um, in the latest community, they drove in cars to school. I've said this many times. And I lived at Nungwa, Kotua here, <laughs> with my grandparents who were settlers, you know. And it was in a little deprived community. And those were, it was the place where you find the girls having the cloth wrapped around your chest and all of that, you know, moving around happily in a very free environment. It was where the fishmongers lived. My grandparents were artisans. My, my grandmother was a chopper operator and my grandfather was an artisanal goldsmith. So I used to help him, you know, with a software to kind of blow the fire and melt the, the ornaments, the gold and the silver and all of that. Um, I lived in a community that had no places of convenience, that had no water. I bathed, not figuratively, but literally, I bathed in the gutter, open gutter. Wow. And we used to, I had to wake up very early in the morning every day and go look for water. I had to go look for a place to throw the garbage away. I had to go look for a place to ease myself. The free range, if you got somewhere in the bush to ease yourself, I mean, it's good enough for you. And it's still happening. 
it's still happening, unfortunately. I mean, and I don't shy away from these things because they actually made me who I am. And I think that it's also the reality of what the ordinary people go through. You know, you need to experience it to understand what people go through on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. I walked several miles to school each day. You know, I started Still in, in a, No, um, Teshizongo. I started um, in a school called Wisdom. And then I moved to a school called Teps. Then I moved to visit or to join my parents later on when they moved to Kumasi. So then I went to State Experimental because, yay, I had Daban. arrived, you know. State okay. Experimental in Durban, right? No, uh, in Kumasi. Yeah, okay, it's in Durban. In, it's in Durban. <laughs> I, I mean, I remember we going to the dining hall and whenever we closed, mm. in the afternoon we've been warned not to go to Atakujum, Okay. where they sell yeah. the kenke and the fish, you know, and we'll cut through the sugar cane <laughs> farms and go to Atakujum and, you know, get kenke and fish to okay. eat. So one day they said a king had died and they want all of us, something like that. So we didn't have to, you know, step out. Step out. Then we went to Atakujum to buy the kinker and eat, and we were coming back to get the bus home. And then in the bush there, there was some big man, giant, giant duck man. He came, he said, hey, <laughs> you know, I mean, the adre adrenaline just set through us. We started running, we we'll ran and fall, run and fall. Down. Then he lifted the sword like that. You know, that was one experience that I can't forget. But thereafter, I moved to Inshai Supreme Tree. Okay. And then, no, I mean, that elitist kind of life was not mine, so I was brought back to join my grandparents and I went back to Why do you say that elitist life was not? Oh, no, it is, I'm just joking okay. about that. <laughs> I'm just joking okay, about might. that. But they brought me back to um, join my grandparents. grandparents. And so I went back to Teps, Teshinungwa Estate, so Teshi Estates Preparatory School, okay. but it was then in the Teshi Zongo. Okay. And so that's where I wrote my common entrance. I was an assistant girls prefect in school, and you know, the little girl, Goskini Wang, and everybody, <laughs> I mean, when they mentioned my name, Goskini Wang, everybody was, oh, where's the Chinese girl? You know, that kind of thing. So, yes, I was quite popular in school because of my name. And then from there, I went to Ada Secondary School. I was in Ada Secondary School for two years, actually. And then my father came back. Um, he had traveled then. And when he came back, he said, no, this is not the school I wanted you to be because we had no electricity in the school. In the school. We had no places of convenience. Mm. It was as if it was going after me. <laughs> my choice was Wesley Girls and Holy Child and Agri Memorial. I didn't get all of those schools, and so I went to Ada Secondary School for two years. And my father brought me to Nungwa Secondary School. I wrote my common entrance, no, I wrote my O-levels mm -hmm. at Nungwa Secondary School, and then went to St. Mary's Girls Secondary. That was my dream, actually, and I was very happy. I passed, but didn't do as well as what I, I mean, I was expected to have done. And so I got very sick. I mean, I was blown. I expected so highly of myself. I, I mean, I'm from an edicogenic family. And so my parents expected so much of me as well. Society expected so much of Were me. Were they disappointed? Everybody was disappointed in me, and I was disappointed in myself. But one of the things I learned from that was that you don't give up. I was so disappointed that I got sick and I became paralyzed Whoa. and I lost my balance. I could not sit. I could not walk. They bit for me in, in, in bed. You know, for several months I was in the hospital. And when I came back from hospital, it's, it actually 
took me a very long time to recover. But one thing was very sure, I never gave up on my dreams and aspirations of going to university because I was, I've seen my father's life. I've seen the people who, I mean, um, who had education and I saw the difference between them and those who didn't have education. Um, when I went to year one, I was now living in secondary school. I was living at Teshinua Estates with my father, because it's now come to Accra. So I grew up in the Teshinua Estates, you know. And so that is why I say it's a checkered life. I saw what it's like to live at Teshinua Estates in a bungalow where people were speaking English, where you're living with the kennels and the wing commanders. And we had Lehman lived a few doors. Dr. Hilla Lehman lived just a few doors away from my house. Mm -hmm. We grew up together with his kids. I went to his home sometimes, you know. I went to almost every room in their house. So you could feel it. You know what I'm talking yeah. about? And so for me, going to university was not an option. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter even if... I had failed some of my A-level, you know, subjects. I did fix this chemistry math. So all along you've wanted to be in the sciences? Oh, oh yes, of course. I mean, th there's one aspect that I haven't mentioned. My father was so educogenic that by the time I was in stage five, my father was giving me books, several books to read, books about positive thinking, you know, amazing results of positive thinking, things like that. And I remember when I was in grade five, my father had given me this book, a newspaper, something about Margaret Thatcher to read. And I read that Margaret Thatcher did chemistry and she did law. And so all I wanted to be was to be like Margaret Thatcher. I wanted to do chemistry. I wanted to do law, you know, after I'd done my chemistry. And so, yeah, I was very focused about that. And I went to the university to do chemistry. I mean, I, I, I had a goal and mm. I had to pursue it, you know. Mm. So, yes, I knew that before I even wrote Common Entrance that I was going to do science. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so um, now let's come back to now. Yes. What does a typical day look like for you? Typical day. So, yeah, I wake up in the morning and then I would make some juices for myself. Um, I do either slurry juice, I would blend and add a little bit of lime and drink. That is the first thing I do. Or uh, I'll take baby spinach with pineapples. You know, I blend and then I drink first thing just to boost me up. Um, I would have prayed or meditated a little. And then, yeah, I'm set for the day. I take care of the house. Sometimes I would go down depending on my schedule and look at the garden, look around the house, and then, you know, in, in all of this, I would be figuring out how my day is going to be like. And then I get myself ready. I go to the office. I do what I have to do. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes I have meetings somewhere. Sometimes I'm traveling. Sometimes I'm going to speak somewhere. Sometimes I'm in a meeting. Yeah, so that's my day. Okay, so I'm um, talking about speaking. You spoke at the Oxford University. Yes, I did. Yes. Um, how did I feel? How, how, what was the highlight for you there? I mean, for me, it was normal. Mm. I have been to the Oxford University before. Um, I was, um, th there is this um, program they call the Oxford Roundtable, but I just went to present a conference paper as a conference participant. But this time, I was invited by the Oxford University to present the David Watson Memorial Lecture, which for me is a big deal, you know, and I was humbled by that. Mm. But it, it didn't feel for me any different because I've been to several international meetings and conferences. 
I've been four times national delegate to the World Health Assembly. I've participated in Codex Alimentarius um, Committee meetings. I have um, participated in ISO international meetings. And so it was another for me, um, like one of those, you know, numerous um, meetings that I have participated in, the Women's Economic Forum, so forth and so on. So it came very naturally to me. But again, it was very humbling that of all the women in the world, Oxford University would honor me mm. by inviting me, not just to present, but to do the David Watson Memorial Lecture at the Green Templeton College. And I thank them for that opportunity. So it was very nice mm. to do that. Okay. All right. So now let's cover to family. We know that Professor Joshua Labi is your husband. Mm. And at a point, he uh, wanted to be flag bearer of the National Democratic Congress, the NDC. Um, when he actually broke the news to you, um, what was your reaction? How did you feel about it? And we also talk about how supportive you were. And you could have been um, an aspiring first lady. So just tell us about how the whole journey was for you. Yeah, it was an interesting one. Um, Prof. Josh, as we call him, is quite democratic and he has to be. Um, the kids call him Big Daddy. So he didn't just break the news to me. I mean, it was a family discussion. The kids needed to contribute, they needed to understand, they needed to say, yes, we, we agree that you do it or you don't do it. So yes, we turned and tossed it for some time and why not? How long did it take to actually settle? I think it took a couple of months. Um, the first one was just, okay, uh, so, you know, Daddy, are you sure you want to do this? You know, that kind of thing. And the, the kids were initially were like, oh, no, there's too much insult, so forth and so on. Then one day we spoke about it again, and he was very serious, and the kids said, well, insults, insults don't kill, do they? Mm -hmm. We're ready for <laughs> it. So, so, yes, so. Then we were all ready to um, give him our support and all of that. And so he did. He went in. But we knew. We were prepared as a sportsman. He told us that any time a sportsman is going into any competition, he knows the outcome could be either a win, a draw, or a lose. Mm. In this case, he said to us, it's either a win or a lose. There are no draws. Okay. So we were ready for that, you know. So I think we had a very, um, very engaging time interacting with people across the length and breadth of the country. I didn't go. I was always at home. Why my not? duty. I mean, my duty is to support and complement his effort. And people do come to the house as well. So my duty was to take part in welcoming people and hosting them when they come. But the actual campaign, you know, whatever it is, was managed by the political team he and his campaign team. So you didn't at any point go with him on his uh, campaign No, I did trip. not. Why not? Oh, I mean, it wasn't my business. I had my business as well. No, but sometimes, you know, it just gives some sort of support when you are just around. I mean, getting to the end, yes, um, a few people wanted to interact with me in Accra, but I didn't go with him those people wanted to interact with me. So I went to meet with them and also answer their questions. Okay, so um, is that the end of the road? We know he didn't win to actually contest for the NDC in next year's election. Is that a road or end of the road for, for you as, as a couple with regards to political ambition? I mean, 
in so long as you have life, you never say that this is the end of the road for me in anything. Because you, we're not God, you know. But one thing I can say is that Prof is a politician. He's been a politician since he was a student. He was a um, NUCS president in Russia, then the USSR, then NUCS Europe. Then he came to Ghana. He went into football administration, which has its own politics. He became an MP. He became a minister. And, you know, he's still been supporting. I don't think that anybody can take those genes or cells out of him. Mm. Politics flows through his blood. And I believe that politics, you serve, you can serve in many different ways. And so I cannot say that that is the end of the road. No, okay. I wouldn't say that. Mm. But of course, in, if you ask me in which specific capacity, I don't know. Only time can okay. tell. Okay. Now, we also know that you're the president of the Lawe Oping University. Is it in Teshi or Nungwa? It's um, at Nungwa. It's Nungwa. So you decided to give back to yes. the society? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So why that's... Um, why did, in the first place, why did you um, decide to set up a university and the location as well? I'm a Nungua girl. Okay. I'm a proud <laughs> Botioko. <laughs> Nungua girl. So there is nothing like going back home, you know, because Nungua made me who I am. The women are very hardworking. I mean, um, I attended Nungwa Secondary School. And I remember, you know, those days when I see the young ladies wearing the green and white uniform and their house dress was the some, you know, fabric with a sheep. It was just my dream to go there. And so I went there and it prepared me for life. Nungwa Secondary did not prepare me for a certificate, mm -hmm. no. Nungwa Secondary built me up to be the woman I am today. And the least I could do is to go back to my home, to my community, my husband and I, to say, you contributed to making us who we are today. We have come back. And it is my hope, it is my dream, that as many Ga women and young ladies will take advantage of Lawa Open University College to enhance themselves and achieve their academic and educational aspirations. Mm. Okay, so um, what's your staff strength like? What's um, student strength like? How has it, the journey been for you yeah. throughout these years um, with the university? You know, being a pay setter, it's not an easy thing. This is the first accredited open university in Ghana and the second in West Africa. And we've heard government after government talk about establishing an open university in Ghana. It's not been easy, not only from a technical and a capacity point of view, but also from the resources that is required to do this, it's been quite challenging. Thankfully, we have been able to do that. We've heard the current president of the current government talk about the fact that very soon they would open and open, they would establish an open university. Well, <laughs> you we have set the, the pace, piece. and we hope that the country would not say that we're going out to bring consultants to do this because the consultants may not understand the contextual challenges and problems. We are doing it. So our arms are open. Mm. They should come. We would share what we're doing with, him, with them in the interest of Ghana, mm. not in the interest of mm. any political party. Mm. In Ghana today, we have just about 16% gross enrollment rushes at the tertiary level. 
So it means that when you take 100 people who qualified to enter the university, only 16 people can have access to the university. Now, the challenge is that even the 16% has been enhanced by distance education. Otherwise, it's far lower than that. Okay, so how do we ensure that in this 21st century, where technology is leading the way in everything and it's making, it's bringing quality to bear in almost every sphere of our lives, how do we ensure that we can use technology to enhance not only access to tertiary education, mm -hmm. but the quality of tertiary education. See, I tell you one thing. What people don't know, unfortunately, is that when we say open education and that it is technology mediated, it does not mean it's inferior. Mm. In fact, there are lots of studies which has done comparative analysis and it shows that Technology-led or mediated education can be as quality, if in some cases, mm. not even more mm. quality. Why? Because you can't easily cut corners if you decide to do it well. Sex for grades and seduction will be minimized to a very, very large extent. The difference is that it focuses on learning. Mm. Learning that is owned by the learner. Okay. It deals with facilitators. It does not deal with lecturers and instructors. Mm. And so it is a system that is very, very flexible, allows you to work. Our students at Lawa Open University can take their lectures, let's say 9, 10 p.m. in the night, either from their kitchens or their bedrooms, whether they are in the office working or whatever it is, mm. they can join their lectures. Mm. And we still have some, you know, face-to-face -face interactions. So it's blended. Oh, right. So um, before I let you go, how have you managed all this with being a mother, all this that you've spoken about? It's the grace of God, first and foremost. And I think that it is also about the support that you get. If you do not have a supporting spouse, a spouse who understands and would encourage you to do what you do best, then you would have challenges. Mm -hmm. So I would say that my husband has been extremely supportive mm -hmm. of me. I mean, um, where I'm very weak, he's strong. And where he's a little weak, I'm a little strong. And so we complement each other. And I think our children are also quite understanding mm. and supporting. But above all, I think that our families have been very supportive as well. His family and my family have been supportive. We also have friends of the family who understand us and are always there to help and support. So it's been about people. Mm. Mm. All right, thank you so much, Professor Goski Alavi, for joining us on the personality profile today. Um, it was really nice having you on set, and we wish you all the best. So thank you. That was um, Professor Goski Alavi. She's a president of the Lawa Oping University. Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, The City Tube. For exclusive breakfast daily content and other City TV programs. Like, comment and share with your friends.